Welcome back to Documentary First, an inside look at a documentary filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Jason Rugg. I'm joined, as always, by Christian Taylor. Hey, Jason. How are you today? Good. Glad to be here. We yeah, have me too. two very special guests we're excited to talk to here, um, both of which are known for Prehistoric Planet 2. That's what we're here to talk about, but they've also worked on some other incredible things. So we'll we'll dig right into this here. We've got uh, Kara Telvi. Telvi? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Glad to have you here. And then, Christian, do you want to introduce our other? Yes. yes. <laughs> so this is Angé Rosemont. Rosemont. Right. Yeah, did I do okay? <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Glad Tried my here. best. So happy to have you guys here. Yeah, I think you also worked on Prehistoric Planet, right? Yep. Yeah, we yeah. both did. Season one and two. Yeah, so we're in season two now. We're going to talk about season two. Uh, I'm sure it's really, um, you know, very similar to what you did in season one. But um, we're going to focus on two because it's out now and you can find it on Apple TV+. Plus. So, Jason, why don't you give us a little bit of the log line and uh, their bios real quick. We, we're going to be short with them today and try to get through it. We want to hear what they have to say. So kick us off with a little bit about what the um, series is about. Yeah, so Prehistoric Planet is from executive producers John Favreau and Mike Gunton and narrated by Sir David Attenborough. It combines award-winning wildlife filmmaking with the latest paleontology learnings and state-of-the-art technology to unveil the spectacular habitats and inhabitants of ancient Earth from a -a one-of-a-kind immersive experience. Um, And it's available on Apple TV Plus, if I'm remembering Mm -hmm, correctly, right? That's correct, yeah. You don't have that written here, just wanted to make sure. Um, yeah, and so then our our two guests, um, we have um, Ange, and some of some of the, <laughs> your credits are just um, absolutely incredible. You got BBC's The Universe, which was just an absolutely incredible series. I love that series. Um, the Planets and IMAX features The Giant Bear Rainforest, which was co-composed <laughs> with Hans Zimmer, um, and then uh, the opening title music for BBC's Frozen Planet Two, also co-composed with Hans Zimmer. Um, do you have any other titles you want to mention before we move on? No, I think that's that's good. Okay. Thank you. And then it's, it's uh, just the, I think it's Great Bear Rainforest. Great Bear Rainforest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. The Great Bear Rainforest. Yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, Kara Talvi, who has worked on uh, Prehistoric Planet al- alongside Hans Zimmer, uh, and then um, we also have you're you're currently working on The Simpsons. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. I've been um, principal composer on The Simpsons for uh, four seasons now. That's absolutely incredible. I would love to hear some more about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's a a separate call, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, Christian, do you want to uh, take it from there? Yeah. So, you guys, I am fascinated to talk with you. Uh, I've only worked with one composer up to this point, and I know that everybody has their own different style. And as I read your bios and dug into your past a little bit, it seems like that you have worked together. Maybe you even went to school together early on. Is that correct? Uh, no, we didn't go to no? school together. We met at Bleeding Fingers. So okay. um, since then, we've been working together um, well, I guess just prehistoric planet, but feels like we work together more because we're also <laughs> getting married next year. So, we're, oh, you wow. two are getting yeah. married! To- oh my oh, goodness! Wow. How about that? Congratulations! Yeah. Congrats. Thank, That's awesome. thank you. Yeah. So we, I don't know. Feels like we work together a lot. <laughs> Yes, your lives are very intertwined. And that's what I got from reading your bios. Um, And I guess I wondered, how did you, you know, fall into this field, choose it? How did you get to where you are today? So we have people that are just starting out as composers that are probably listening to this right now. And they're looking at your resumes, looking at you on IMDb, and wondering how in the world did you get here from where you started? So uh, can you summarize that pretty quickly for us? Um. Yeah, well, I, I was born in a small chicken-shaped country called Slovenia. It's tucked between Italy, Austria, Croatia, and Hungary. There's only two million of us, um, but we have, you know, influences from the Western countries, Italy and uh, France, northern countries, Austria, and on the east, you know, the Balkan nations. Uh, so we have a very, very deep-rooted heritage of of music and art because of that uh every village has 
its own choir, church choir or brass band. We have three professional orchestras in our capital of Ljubljana. Uh, you know, that's inhabited, I think, less than 300,000 people. Um, we have our music academy where I also studied music composition at. And if you ever have the privilege, if I can say, to go to Ljubljana, especially during the summer, and just walk around, you will see how much music there is everywhere. Hmm. Um, there is a concert that there's like multiple concerts of e every single style that you can go to on any any given night. So I was surrounded by that from my early childhood, and I just had this passion of writing music. So that's what I did for most of my life for the past twenty years. Uh, I've <laughs> I think yeah. I read that you started at nine or something, composing. Well, yeah, I mean, you could say that I started at nine, but what I was doing from nine till about 19, I would say, was not a pleasant listening experience. <laughs> <laughs> I can um, double down on that. It was not good. <laughs> um, yeah, we were just listening to some of my uh, crap early music a few days ago with Kara. Um, but you know, it's, I think what's, if we're speaking to the younger generation, it's not about how talented you are per se, but how much passion and time you're willing to put into the craft that you aspire to get good at. If I would spend the same amount of time that I spent writing music, doing anything, I would be pretty good at it. Probably. It just happened to be that I liked writing music. Yeah, I mean, how often do we hear that? Ever, you know, you talk about how crappy it was for those ten years or whatever, but it is all of that fundamental, foundational making of mistakes and making bad stuff in order to start figuring out how to do it right. And we talk all the time on this podcast about you have to stick it out and you have to work hard, and it, you can't quit or else it won't ever happen. So, um, thank you for that word because it just echoes what we've been saying for sure. Um, what about you, Kara? Tell us about your ascension to where you are today? <laughs> so I come from a musician family, kind of. My grandma was a pianist and my dad is a guitar player. So I was always kind of surrounded by the influence of classical music from my grandma and my dad is more of a jazz head. So I got to combine these two things and I think it helps me a lot with my composition and also especially my work on The Simpsons where often we have to do show tunes or songs and that jazz stuff really helps me with that task. Um, but yeah, when I was young, I was always taking piano lessons, which I did not thoroughly enjoy, but eventually <laughs> it grew on me and I really wanted to do film music because I was really inspired by the music of Thomas Newman. Um, ah. So I went to Berkeley College of Music to try to pursue this and I got a really good foundation there and I made a lot of connections. Um, and then I wanted to make sure that I had some stuff set up in LA cause I knew that's the place I need to go when I graduate. Right. So I had internships and some assistant positions lined up and eventually, uh, I ended up at bleeding fingers where I was a tech assistant for a while, not that long, maybe like six or seven months. And then I eventually, got promoted to composer. So it's been quite the journey. And here yeah, we are. Quite the ride. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering what, uh, you know, composers inspired you. So what about you, Ange? What about your inspirations? Well, I would say that probably my first inspiration was Tchaikovsky. Mm. Um, um, when when I lived with my parents in Nashville, Tennessee for um, three years, from 95 to 98, uh, they took me, especially my mom, she was adamant that we go see the Nutcracker by the Nashville Symphony. Um, so mm -hmm. for the three years that we were there, after the first year, I wanted to go mm -hmm. listen to the Nutcracker every single December. <laughs> and I think, was it two years ago with Kara, we went to... We were in Slovenia and we went to the um, uh, Ljubljana Opera House to see the Nutcracker. I tried wow. to see it. 
it's still one of my favorites. Uh, I now now I have to go to that opera house. I have to go to your country because it sounds just <laughs> it sounds like it's incredible. Yeah. Um but yeah, Tchaikovsky and then with film music, you know, the obvious John Williams, Star Wars and Indiana Jones and then later on Hans Zimmer's Gladiator and The Rock and Howard Shore's Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you've had an incredible, um, you know, you've been exposed to an, an incredible, um, you know, mentor where you are. What's it been like to work there? Um, you know, and, and how are you a better composer by working uh, with Hans Zimmer? Uh, we'll start well, with you. Huh? Yeah. So, I mean, what's what's special about Bleeding Fingers is that um, we we are a collective of composers. Uh, we all have our own projects, or if we collaborate like we did with Care on Prehistoric Planet. Um, but, you know, there's so many doors of people working on music, and there's always someone that knows something better than you. So if you need help, there's always someone. Now, you know, you can imagine what kind of privilege it is that we also have Hans basically working next door and learning from him, which almost every single composer alive now, uh, you know, um, looks up to him. So it's an extreme honor and privilege. And just by, but I'll go back to my first point, just by working on music every day, you get better. It's very hard to, work on something every day, put your time into it and get worse at it. Very true. Good point. Oh. Kara, what about oh, you? Yeah, I mean, I second that. Um, he pretty much summed it up. It's really cool to be on a campus with really seasoned, great composers, and we can all share our knowledge together. And um, Hans's main goal for this kind of score and for anything that we do. And our goal is just to think outside the box and make it unique and special and um, do something that brings something new to the table. And so oh. I did, I did watch, um, you know, the first episode of prehistoric planet two. And I will say what my favorite thing is, is clearly the music. It's incredibly creative. Uh, it does take you off to a different place. Um, I was not sure where uh, the score left off and sound effects came in uh, because they were kind of, you know, together sort of mixed into the music. And so I would love to hear about your creative process in general. But then I know there was a very special creative process for this prehistoric planet series. So Angie, why don't we start with you and talk a little bit about the creative process that you guys use and then um, maybe talk more specifically about what was different about this particular production. So yeah, as Kara said, what comes down from Hans and then later from Russell Emanuel, our CEO and score producer is um, before any project, we go through this period of what we can call maybe a pre-compositional process or a brainstorming process where we just ponder. So it, with Prehistoric Planet, the pondering was about how to make these amazing, majestic creatures of the past relatable. Uh, how do we help the illusion that, uh, that the producers were uh, intending that the audience is seeing actual animals living their lives like they would be watching, you know, planet Earth. So how do we help the solution with the music? Our answer to that was to use orchestra, uh, BBC National Orchestra of Wales we ended up recording with. On the other hand, we wanted to transport the listener back in time 66 million years ago. So how do we do that? So then we came up onto the, this idea, let's try to make instruments out of the materials of which we can study dinosaurs today, meaning fossils, bones, uh, fossil replicas, uh, rocks, petrified wood. And, yeah, so what, uh, 
What was that like, Kara? I mean, were you on board with this idea? And, you know, did one person come up with this idea? Are you oh, showing us those instruments back there? One. Yeah, here, there it is. Oh, oh how wow. are you zooming in there? <laughs> wow. Uh, That's I have cool. A cool. I have a cool camera now. <laughs> very cool camera. Um, yeah, <laughs> you people that are listening are going to have to go to YouTube and watch what he just zoomed in on. What what, what is that, actually? Can um, you zoom back in and talk oh, us through yeah, what no, that let is? Me, let me bring it closer. That's even better. Oh, I, I just realized I had my headphones on while the speakers were still blasting. So maybe That's I'll... why it was echoing. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm sorry. Oh my goodness gracious. So this is this is the last instrument that we built for season 2. It's called the Triceratone, built out of a Nedoceratops fossil skull replica, double bass neck, ammonite crest and Oh my gracious! That is unbelievable. It does make well, a very cool sound. Let me um, hold up the head towards the camera because we did see the um, we saw the neck of it, but move closer to the camera because we can't really see you well. There, look at that. <laughs> so well, I'm assuming you're giving me a workout. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming that that was a replica skeleton. Yes. Yes. Is it? You said it was a metal cast of it. It's um, like a what's the material, Anche? It's almost like it's not plastic. It's almost like a paper mache ish material with like a plastic cast over it. Oh, okay, wow. yeah. you took it away too soon. I was going to ask you to play it for us. <laughs> uh, we can send you some clips, I think, because we're low on time. It's oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, we are. Awesome. I got so engrossed in what you were doing that um, I lost track of the time already. We, we really only have a few minutes left. So uh, let me skip through my questions. Uh, we talked about the custom built. Okay, well, you've been um, nominated for an Emmy, it sounds like. Yeah, somehow. Yeah, talk, talk <laughs> to me about that experience. <laughs> well, there's um, not much to say about it other than we're extremely shocked and honored um to be you know nominated by our talented peers and that the music was acknowledged is an amazing feeling how did you find out um <laughs> i was well, trying to figure out why i was outside on our front porch trying to figure out why our landlord was making me take all my lavenders and roses off the front porch <laughs> So I was talking to some construction workers, and then Kara started screaming, We got nominated! We got nominated! <laughs> yeah. Well, our, the PR, Impact 24, Andrew Cohen from Impact 24 called us. So Because we were just... very sure that we were not getting nominated, so it's not something we were like... We weren't refreshing the page or anything, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Well, congratulations for that. Um, we, Thank you. We, we had you bring a docu deja vu really quickly, um, so I want you to let me know a, a, a documentary that you recommend, although we haven't officially gone into the docu deja vu segment, so, uh, but we're going to have you throw that out, and then we're going to have you uh, just give a word of advice. Now, uh, you've already given a few pieces of advice to our audience, but think about... Um, um, the specific piece of advice is how do you build your career in LA? That's the advice I want you to give. Um, but while you're thinking about that, uh, tell me a documentary that you recommend we watch. We'll talk, start with you, Kara. I recommend you watch The Staircase. Mm, tell us why you like it and where we can find it. I've, it's on Netflix and probably somewhere else, but I know it's on Netflix. And um, it is a murder trial. And I love these things. <laughs> it's and I don't weird. think he did it, by the way. So I will <laughs> just say that I believe it was an owl. And we will get to that point. Okay. A lot of people think this is a conspiracy, but I just don't buy it. I think that it was the owl. <laughs> and Michael <laughs> Peterson is innocent. And... Everybody leave him alone. <laughs> that's, that's I love it. it. My, I love my it. Drop. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, 
Is well, this the series where they made the documentary in the mid two thousands and then they made like a drama series yeah, like, last they year? Did. Okay. Yeah. I remember that. And I was I, it's, they're both on my list. So I, yeah, I'm so excited heard, to hear you. The drama is really good too. And okay. it, the drama goes through the possible ways that it could have happened. I think the owl is included. I forget. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it's really good. It's a good watch. Okay. That's fantastic. Great. All right, Ajay, what's about you? Well, we, we watch all these documentaries and everything we watch together with Kara. Uh, so I, I am, I don't know if uh, Michael did it. Uh, I'm on the fence. <laughs> Um, but I also made Kara watch Ancient Apocalypse on Netflix. Ooh. Um, it's uh, I've been following the reporter uh, and novelist writer Graham Hancock since, I don't know, early 2000s when I watched a documentary called a- uh, Lost Civilizations on, on uh, Netflix. So uh, Graham's theory is that there might have been uh, uh, an ancient civilization that lived before the last ice age 12,800 years ago and now it's almost I think fact uh, that a giant comet splintered in around Earth's orbit around 12,800 years ago crashed into the Canadian ice sheets caused mass destruction floods and ended the Ice Age, killed all the megafauna, and that's why we have all the Noah Ark deluge myths in all cultures. Oh, wow. So Ancient Apocalypse explores that theory, and I think it's a very interesting watch. I will say that I absolutely thought that the music choices were horrendous. Um, <laughs> interesting. Uh, <laughs> Might have to cut that out. <laughs> I really, I really thought... I really thought that the music was like. I mean, it was very, very loud. It's very not necessarily loud. the composer's fault, but. Yeah, mm-hmm. no, I think. I don't think there was a composer. I think it was all library music. That's why I can say. It. If there was a composer, I apologize. But yeah, it was, over, <laughs> it was overly loud. Uh, but yeah, with Graham Hangout, you journey from, you know, North America to Turkey to, I think, Syria and. Well, thank you for very, that recommendation. Yeah, so That's while awesome. you're still speaking, why don't you give us a last word, a parting word of advice? A uh, parting word of advice of how to make a career in uh, Los Angeles, I will turn it around and say how to com- make a career in any field, anywhere in the world. I think the most important thing to note is that um, you have to be passionate about it. You have to love what you do because if you don't love what you do you will not be able to spend the adequate time Mm -hmm. to get better at the craft whatever that might be great and don't and don't be a dick (laughs) (laughs) sorry Sorry. we're literally on a podcast (laughs) i think it's you, you can, People you can absolutely, hear that. <laughs> you absolutely can say that on our podcast. I live okay, in a house with five men. I live in a house with five men and they would have gotten that message. So it's actually <laughs> very true. Um, so anyway, don't, don't apologize. All right, Kara, what's your last parting word of advice? Okay. Um, don't be a dick. That's not. <laughs> um, Kara. What? <laughs> um, <laughs> I agree with Anja. It's being personable and in anything you do, be a person that people want to work with and um, the rest is going to fall into place. And of course, when people say get your 10,000 hours, that is not a joke. It's a real thing. Um, That's when you become an expert in your field. And I think we definitely (laughs) have those hours now but it's a long path to really know what you're doing and if you want to learn from people there is a way to reach out to them in in a way that makes them want to help you so you know these cold emails sometimes that we get hi can you help me with this it's not really like um, going to be fruitful for anyone. So my advice is to really try to connect with people, listen to their work, um, and 
they will be willing to help you. Well, that's just beautiful. Such good go advice. Ahead. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, we have to let us. you guys go. We're, we're right down to the wire. So yeah. thank but you both everybody for, stick for around. coming by. Don't, yep. don't we, leave, we, listeners. <laughs> well, they were just fantastic. That was that, so fascinating. I know. They were so fascinating. I just <laughs> could have talked to them much longer for sure because we were starting to get into the meat of uh, you know their instruments and their creative process. Yeah. And I sure <laughs> would have loved to have dug around that dirt a little bit more. It's so fascinating to me that like, I know Hans Zimmer has talked about like playing the guitar with a nail instead of a pick yeah. to like, yeah. you know, really, you know, he like, he'll break instruments and he'll just play them weird. And it seems like that ethos really carried over into what they're doing where it's like, let's, you know, make a stand up bass out of a <laughs> triceratops skull. And <laughs> so that was just so killer. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, their their Super creativity cool. just pervades every single thing they do. You know, even yeah. the spaces they live in and how they were talking just about other things, whether they're other movies that they watched and uh instruments that they wanted to work on and what their background was. Uh, just super interesting people. I really am cheering them on for that Emmy. Oh, uh, yeah. how amazing would that be? Yeah, that I mean they totally deserve it too. Like the music is just phenomenal and ah. Yeah, <laughs> it's just so well, cool to, to see so many amazing artists getting to work on just incredible different things, you know, break yeah, out. Of we'll the have them back for sure. We'll have oh, yeah. them back and <laughs> they can talk about their upcoming projects and we'll talk to Kara about the Simpsons. That's got to be interesting. And yeah. uh, anyway, best of luck to them. So, Jason, we do have a little bit of shopkeeping here to do. I'm going to give you a documentary first company update. Uh, it has been an interesting time over the last few weeks. We did do a Girl Who Wore Freedom screening in Ormond Beach uh, Florida. It was an incredible screening. Uh, we partnered with the church, the Episcopal church across the street. We held the screen, two screenings there. It sold out immediately on the first day when it was announced. And so wow. we had two full screenings and, uh, people just loved the film and, you know, just couldn't stop talking about it, wanted to share it with people, bought DVDs. Uh, that was incredibly exciting. Another museum came up and wanted us to come back to their museum. Uh, it was it was really refreshing. It's the first screening I've done in a long time, and it was refreshing to me to see how much our film still moves people and how many – it reminded me how many people out there still haven't seen it. So yeah. it was just beautiful to watch it with people, see them laugh, see them cry, uh, hear all of their questions afterwards. They love to stay and talk and share stories. Uh, one special thing happened during my time in Ormond Beach that I do need to share because, mm. I mean, who else would this happen to but me? But I really needed some time to recoup after, you know, some difficult things have happened in the last few months. And I decided I was going to book a few days, extra days, just to be at the beach so the very first morning I got there, I'm out there at like, you know, I don't know, 5.30, 5.45, something like that, watching the sun come up. It was amazing. And I was, but I was there so early because the night before I wanted to watch the sunset and I stayed out until 11 o'clock till the sun was long gone, just being there, listening wow. to the waves. I get up and I get to my room and my glasses are gone. And I was like, no, 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 where are my glasses? So I took my flashlight and I walked all the way outside. I look for my glasses for a half an hour. And here's oh. the scary part. We were where sea turtles lay their eggs and you're not oh. supposed to walk around outside with any like flashlights or anything like that. Yeah. So here I'm going, I have to have my glasses, but I don't want to scare the sea turtle babies away. You know, and I was just really torn about this dilemma, but I look for my glasses anywhere, went straight to where I was sitting. I looked all around me, no glasses. I went back to my little cabin. I'm asking God, please let me find my glasses. And I just prayed all through the night. I'm like, I'm going to get up really early. So 545, I'm out there and I'm the first person out there. I walk out to where I'd sat the day before and there were my glasses just sitting right there. And I was like, well, that was easy. So I sat down, I was watching the sunrise and all of a sudden this woman came up to me and said, well, you must've been the first one out here. And I was like, well, I was. And she said, is it something special? And I said, well, not really. It's my first day at the beach. And she said, I'm like, is it special for you? And she goes, well, it's my 70th birthday and I'm here to celebrate life. And I was like, that is so beautiful. So we started talking. She asked me why I was there. I told her. And when I told her about the screening for the girl who wore freedom and what the movie was about, she said, oh, 
my dear friend back at home was born in a cave in France and during the occupation. And she survived on breast milk and potatoes. And she wow. stayed in that cave until the American soldiers liberated her. Wow. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, seriously? <laughs> That's, I just can't even believe it. It was just oh too much gosh. to believe. But I felt like it was a moment I was meant to be there for, you know? And had I not lost my glasses, I probably wouldn't have been out there early in order to meet my friend, my now friend, Michelle. So that was a very special moment. And we had a great screening and I left from there and I went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky once again to do some more research with the Pratt Museum and my new hero, Pat Sealing. So Pat Sealing is a first Lieutenant Pat Sealing. He is the historian, the current historian at the Pratt Museum. He's working under Dr. John O'Brien and he is passionate about history. I met him for the first time when I was, um, you know, filming there in the museum. But then we ran into each other in Normandy, got to spend some more time talking. And he just is just incredibly passionate. And he's offered to help us with Heroes of Carenton. So he's come on board as uh, the one of the historical consultants for this film. And so he and I went in there digging through all of the archives on Fort Campbell. They have a museum that has a few little warehouse rooms that we dug around in and file cabinets. They have a field house just full of stuff that nobody really ever sees. And then the most tragic thing of all is that they have this giant warehouse in the back 40 almost that has holes in the roof where birds fly in, lay their nests. There are dead birds on the floor. There's bird poop everywhere. It is a tragedy and a travesty and all of these amazing historical documents and there's vehicles and there's, you know, anything you can imagine, clothes and weapons and just all these things lying all over the place with bird poop all over them. And it made me very angry as a taxpayer, I have to say. And the thing that made me so sad is that we found stuff in there. It was like, at some point I said, this is like going through my grandmother's attic. And Pat said, this is like going through every grandmother's attic you've ever known. And I was like, <laughs> that is what it's like because it was taking days, you know, like such a long time for us to get anywhere. Wow. Um, and we found Bud Harper's, like a bunch of Bud Harper's items. And it looks like they were taken from his desk. And but Colonel Bud Harper was one of the colonels in World War II with the 101st Airborne Division that fought in the Battle of Carenton. And all of his personal stuff was just thrown in a box and just shoved into this file cabinet. And I just sat there looking at this man's life and just wanted to cry because nobody cares about this stuff. Um, you know, and that was true across many different boxes that we found many different collections. And so I was happy to be in there caring about those, you know, documents and stuff, but I just didn't have enough time to do a ton of research. So I left and there was a drawer that I had opened and I saw a, a picture book in there, but I didn't have time to go and open it. And so I called Pat and I was like, can you just go and check in that book? Cause I've been dreaming about it. And so the next day he went back into the archives and he opened a file cabinet and he started pulling out that book and a few others. And we hit a mother load of stuff that nobody has ever seen. And it's from one of the heroes of Caraton that absolutely nobody knows about. And we found things that we can use in our film oh, that wow. are contemporaneous that uh, this soldier did. And uh, I'm just beyond excited because we have a really clear, uh, I feel completely led to these items and we have a way to work them into the script now. So uh, that, that's the most exciting news really is that we have continued to re receive direction about how this script is going to go. So Zach Callahan and I are, you know, trying to figure that out. Now we have to transcribe a bunch of things. Uh, it's just we're scanning a bunch of pictures and documents. Pat's be become a scanning expert over there at the Pratt Museum. So yeah, <laughs> that's so that's incredible. the update. Yeah, the wow. next few weeks are going to be a lot of continued research and organization of all the things that we found and um, writing our outline. So that's what's going on right now. Well, awesome. Um, I guess it's time for DocuVu Deja Vu. DocuVu. 
DocuView Deja Vu. Jason, I don't think you have anything for today. So I'm going to take the whole time today. Uh, I want to talk about something that I think people really, really ought to listen to. Uh, and this is actually a podcast that was done on Fresh Air at NPR, NPR with Terry Gross and Lucas Shaw of Bloomberg called The Changing Hollywood Landscape. It's a podcast. It lasts about 45 minutes. We will put the link uh, in our show notes. Uh, the Changing Landscape of Hollywood is something that really no one can figure out. But I think Lucas Shaw, because he's been studying this so long for such a high level, has some deep insights that I think we all need to listen to. Uh, and mm. I still think that nobody can truly predict where we're going. But what it made me realize was how much of the corporate business at the top is really determining everything. Oh, yeah. And um, we're in uncharted territory. You know, we really yeah. are. Yeah. Um, it are there any key takeaways beyond that that you want to? The one um, that stuck in my head was that these corporations, whether they're Disney, Amazon, Apple TV, they are not in the business of entertainment. They're in the business of selling things. They're in the business of yeah. advertising. Yeah. And so what they really care about is their business and making sure that it's viable and making sure that, you know, it's continuing to make money. And thankfully, businesses like Amazon and Apple TV have many other things that they can rely on to support their business. Entertainment is not their main one. As Bob Iger said himself, um, you know, he's trying to figure out what to do with probably selling off some of his properties. It it really is interesting. And thankfully, I mean, I'm thankful for the strike, um, for the writer strike and the actor strike, simply because it is time to, to renegotiate the way all of these things happen. It used to be so clear and cut and you yeah. could amend things so that it felt fair to everybody, but it just doesn't anymore. It's just like, there's no way to have any sort of equitable pay no. for people in the way that things are structured right now. So um, that was my takeaway. Which is why I think, um, I don't know, have you looked into uh, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck's um, new production company? No, I have not. Tell me more. So it might actually just be called like equity filmmaking or something. But the whole thing is like, if you work on it, you own a chunk of it and you get paid as if you own a chunk of it. Like that's hmm. part of your compensation for being on, on the thing. And I might be misremembering that exactly, but it's like they wanted people to be able to have a slice of the pie. And so like air, the movie they just recently released, um, was made by that production company. And so you have like the director of photography owns a small chunk of it and will get residual pay for that for the rest of their life. And so that's kind of like, they're trying that they're seeing mm -hmm. if that works. They're seeing if there's a model there because they were starting to realize that this isn't working for anyone. And, you know, I think that it's interesting that you have these people who like Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, are fine. They could live within the studio system for the rest of their lives, make a ton of money, get paid millions of dollars every time they get, you know, cast in a movie and that's it. But they said no, because this actually isn't sustainable for the people down below. And they're, they're at the top and they send the elevator back down. And I think that's cool. And I think that hopefully we're going to see more stuff like that come from this. Um, Yeah. So we, we, maybe we yeah, should do an episode where we do like a deep dive on that. Cause that would be really interesting to just talk about what they're doing and how they're doing it. Yeah. Can we get them on? Can somebody work that out? Yeah. Let's get Ben Affleck <laughs> and Matt Damon on. I'd love that. I mean, they're not working right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They should be able to come on. Uh, yeah. You know, they're amazing people. And I do think that it is going to take that quite frankly. Tr I have felt forever that it is the crew that really gets screwed in this equation completely. Even now in the strike, they're the ones that are taking the brunt of it because, you know, actors and actresses, it doesn't matter if you're at my level or if you're at Ben Affleck's level, um, the talent always get paid more than the crew working. And yeah. I just, and then they work harder, you know, it's more physical. Um, and I just feel like that's not very just. So yeah. I'm glad to know that there are people that are addressing that. Speaking of Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, uh, or I guess I should say Casey Affleck and Matt Damon, that movie Oppenheimer that I saw last night was <laughs> for real. That was unbelievable. I have never seen Casey Affleck be so scary. 
Like, he was I was, so scary. I was, I was shocked. Like, for only being in, like, two scenes, like, oh, man. Uh, we can do a whole I episode wanna... talking about Oppenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I saw it in the, you know, the, the the theater where, you know, you, like, actually feel like a bomb is going off. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was, that really makes a difference So when you see the film. You can't have that experience at home. No, it's a must-see in theaters. It's theaters sure. or what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, that's kind of it for us today. Thank you guys so much for listening. You want to take us out of here? Yeah. Thank you for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.